here, uh, still praying for snow. Some of you need to pray harder. <laughs> Kyle's been praying. He's getting tired. His knees are getting sore praying so much for snow. I did see that he fogged his garage the other day with that sweet smell of snowmobile exhaust. So uh, that, that looked uh, very enticing. So uh, winter will come, I promise. Uh, just a few things that I want to announce. I do have a couple of clipboards. I'll send one down each side. These are for Cookie Fellowship that we'll be having on the 20th. Uh, make sure you have that marked on your calendar. That will be our Christmas program here at the church. And we'll be having, the, like I said, the Christmas or the Cookie Fellowship afterwards. We are also having a Christmas Eve service. I've gotten a couple of calls on that. So we have both of those. Uh, the Christmas program is on the 20th in the evening, Christmas Eve, Christmas Eve evening. So uh, have those on your calendar. Today we do have communion, and so this morning as we do um, our service, it's going to be a little bit different. We're going to, it's going to be broken up a little bit, and so um, kids don't take off for junior church right away because we still have uh, another part of the church coming and some more singing, so that will look a little bit different. Uh, this coming up week we have an elders meeting, and then uh, next week, uh, what I've done is I've placed our budget on the back table. I need you to grab one of those and take a look at it. Uh, on the second sheet of paper, I put down what the big changes are in the budget. Don't ignore everything else, but those are some of the big changes that you need to take a look at. So if you are a member here, go ahead and look through there. And I explained some of the, the changes so that we can have a, just a brief discussion at the business meeting. And so next Sunday, immediately following the church service, uh, it shouldn't, I hate to even say this, it shouldn't be a very long meeting. Um, there's really the budget it will be our main focus um, and taking a look at that. And uh, we're going to need to, we have one other item that we're going to be taking a look at. So uh, that should be very, very simple. Uh, so plan on that. And then also, uh, we have a new baby in the house today. Not Livy, but the baby that's with Livy. <laughs> so, yeah, just, you know, pass the baby around. We, we can't pass the... <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> I don't know the words to that song, but uh, so yeah, we can't pass the offering plate, so we'll just pass the baby around. Let her, yeah. So, I uh, just want a couple other announcements. It was mentioned this morning in Sunday school, and maybe you're just unaware of it. Um, we do have a Sunday school class for everyone, and so I just encourage you to be here and be a part of that. Um, for Sunday school. Sunday school starts at 9.30, gets done at 10.30, and we have a 15-minute break. So I uh, would love to have you be a part of that and a part of our discussions. The ladies are meeting downstairs right now. The men are meeting up here. Uh, we're kind of going through just some basic Bible beliefs, some things we need to know about the Bible. And so that's been a, a really good discussion um, to have that. So I encourage you to be here. Uh, if you haven't noticed, you're blind. Uh, the church got decorated last week, so just a uh, thank you to those that were here, and we're a part of that, and um, thank you for that. I'm not going to ask when de-decorating is. That would seem like I was a Scrooge. So, uh, would you all stand, and we will open in prayer. Let's pray. Father, we are thankful just for this season of the year. We are thankful for the gift of your Son and all that that means. Father, this morning as we sing about that, as we look to your word in every part of our service this morning, I pray that our focus would be on you and all that you have done for us. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen.
How majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens. Out of the mouth of babies and infants, you have established strength because of your foes to still the enemy and the avenger. When I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is man that you are mindful of him and the son of man that you care for him? God, it is an amazing thing just as we just sang the the song that heaven's joy, Christ, would come and take our bitter cup from us. It is an amazing thing. We don't want to just focus on it just because it's the Christmas season, but Father, that it would always be before us that you are a God who loves. You are a God who cares. You are a God who provides a way when there was no other way. And we are so thankful for that. Father, bless your word this morning, we pray it in Christ's name, amen. You may be seated. You guys can go ahead and have a seat out. We have been in this series of looking for a hero, and I think I have seen it even more so as we take a look at the life of Elijah, just this thought of God choosing somebody for something, for his purpose, out of everybody else. And the reason that I say even more so for Elijah is because we find in the book of James this verse, The prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours, and he prayed fervently that it might not rain. And then we find out what the results of that prayer is, that for three and a half years it didn't rain, and it was dry, and it was horrible, and it was felt throughout the land. And it was, as we looked at last week, just this incredible burden that was not just on Elijah, but the people started to put this pressure on him. And certainly the king and the queen are upset with him because they know he is the one who has prayed to God. He says, that's all right. I'll pray that it rains right after we have this little battle on Mount Carmel. And it is a cool battle that happens. And the prophets of Baal against the prophet of God and all that would go on there and his joking and everything else through the process to bring it to a point where they would know without a shadow of a doubt that God is the only God and the only one that they had any right to worship. Our lesson in all of that is not that you were like Elijah. (laughs) Our lesson is not that God uses ordinary people so you have a chance. Although we can take that from that scripture. God chose people like Noah and we've, we've looked at his life and Abraham and Moses as well. And there is something about these men that I I almost hate to say there's something special about them because I do feel like God could have the same effect in any one of our lives. But for some reason, 
we don't get to that point. There's some struggle. There's something that keeps us. And, and I think we need to look at that. We're going to see it as we move on, as we take a look at David and Daniel and Jonah and even the life of Mary and, and her choosing why Mary of all the women in the world to become the mother of Christ. In this, we've turned to Hebrews 11 several times. It is their faith that makes them some sort of hero to us. It is their faith that, that brings out something in their lives, something that they have done, something that they've exercised, and, and it shows us that these truly are exceptional people. Their faith, this, this thing that gives them this assurance that they had and things that they had had only hoped for. This, this looking ahead, this, this wanting something bigger from God to have in their own lives and then you see it in their actions that this, this conviction runs deep to, to see, to look ahead, to know and living for things that were not yet to be seen. As you read through Hebrews 11, how many times does it say, and them not seeing it before they died held on to that? The thing you hope for? The thing you live for? The thing you can't see? <laughs> might not. You might die in the hope. But isn't that what we hope for? Isn't that what we look for and long for? Something in their faith, because of their faith, they became very pleasing to God. And God would look down on their lives, and God makes this promise to us, that if we not only acknowledge that he exists, but if we would seek him out, he rewards that. He is the rewarder of those who seek him. And that's what their faith was doing. So these sinners chose to be faithful. How could they not? Look at all the stuff that they saw. To see the hand of God working in their own lives, growing that faith that they had, and, and they stumbled. They made mistakes. We look at every one of them and we go, wow, why'd you do that? <laughs> Armel, oh, just kill me. Moses, who challenges God. God's talking to him out of a burning bush and he says, oh, but I can't do that, God. <laughs> I'm the God who's talking to you out of a burning bush. Throw your staff down, it becomes a snake. Pick it up, it becomes a stick again. I've got this. And he still doubts. And Abraham, who lies about his wife because of fear. That's a funny thing about faith, is that that in our lives, it, it takes some amazing steps forward. It takes some part on ours. The, the seeds of faith certainly are planted in our past and, and the things where we've seen God work, but the growth of our faith, that takes some really big steps. Are any Indiana Jones fans out there? I love Indiana Jones. There's so much good Bible taught in Indiana Jones. Raiders of the Lost Ark. It's the Ark of the Covenant. I mean, that's, that's what they're looking for. The, the quest for the Holy Grail. I mean, that's the cup that caught the blood of Christ, supposedly. Well, in Indiana Jones, the quest for the Holy Grail. They finally get to the Grail Temple, and there's this great seal that they have to go through, and there's, there's three passages, there's three things that are said on this great seal. The first one is the breath of God. And then in it, it says that only the penitent man will pass. So here's the secret, here's the clue. As they walk in and he feels the breath of God, this breeze that happens and it blows all these gross, icky cobwebs, he has to bow down and there's a blade that swings across and just misses chopping him a half. The next test is the word of God. Only in the footsteps of God will he proceed. And so he gets to this thing, and there's all these letters, and he has to step on the ones that spell Jehovah. And as he's stepping on them, he steps on one wrong letter. Oh, wait, wait, wait. In Hebrew, it's not that way. And he makes it through to the other side. And then the last test. He's standing at this great big canyon, and he knows that he needs to get over to the other side. And it is with this one 
the path of God. And all he needs to do is from this statue that he's holding on to, this lion statue, he needs to, to take this leap of faith and just that step and there's this fear, there's this, what am I going to do? How do I get there? And so he finally steps out and he steps onto this bridge that is painted the same color as a canyon and there's no way to see it until you step out on it and you go, oh. And he takes the gravel and he throws it across the path and is able to walk across. That, that step of faith and I'm sure that there are times in our walk that this faith seems like, I don't want to go into that canyon. But it requires this leap of faith, this faith that we need to have, taking the next step, taking a, a step out onto the bridge that you cannot see, taking a step out there. And it is our faith that grows in those steps. So on one hand, we have these heroes that really aren't that special. And on the other hand, we have these heroes that are very special. There's something about them. There's something that we can look at in their lives. In Luke chapter 9, if you would take your Bible and turn there. Luke records a series of events that brings in our hero Elijah and shows us a a picture of the Old Testament Elijah meeting up with Christ and finding out just what people thought of Christ. And there had to be some scary things about Christ for people. And we'll take a look at what those are. So in these series of events, there's this incredible faith that is pointed out. Luke is very careful to do that, to show that these men, even though they're not going to find him in Hebrews 11, here's some men that had some great faith. And all of this leading up to this point of, at the Mount of Transfiguration, this communion, this, this reunion that Christ has with Moses and Elijah. Luke chapter 9, I'm going to start in verse 18. It says this, Now it happened that as he was praying alone, the disciples were with him, and he asked them, Who do the crowds say that I am? And they answered, John the Baptist. But others say, Elijah, and others, that one of the prophets of old has risen. Then he said to them, But who do you say that I am? And Peter answered, The Christ of God. In Matthew, Matthew goes on a little bit further to say that Christ had a response for Peter. Blessed are you, Peter. Blessed are you, Simon, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. There is something about Peter's faith that he looks at Christ and he he knows he's not John the Baptist. He knows that he's not Elijah come back from the dead, though people were certainly looking for that. And, And not even from the dead. We'll take a look at the death of Elijah in a little bit. But they're looking for this Elijah to come and so maybe this is it. And there are some people that are excited about this, that this is who Christ could be. Peter very clearly says, I know exactly who you are. You're Christ, the Son of God. Let's go on, verse 21. He strictly charged and commanded them to tell this to no one, saying, The Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised. And here starts this this journey that Christ is going to have with his disciples, this journey of the, the journey to Jerusalem, the journey to the cross, and he's going to remind them a couple more times that when he gets to Jerusalem, there's one thing that's going to happen. He's going to be killed. But follow me. As a matter of fact, the very next next verses, verse 23. He said to all, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. Now, we've so often heard those verses pulled out of context, not, not in a bad way, but just that we hear those verses, well, take up your cross and follow Christ. This happens right after Christ says, I'm going to Jerusalem to be killed. Follow me. Take up your cross. We'll have fun together. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. For what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses or forfeits himself? For whoever is ashamed of me and my words, of him will the Son of Man be ashamed when he comes in his glory 
and the glory of the Father and of the holy angels. But I tell you truly, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God. There is a reward for faith. There is a reward. There is, there is something to look forward to. The reward is mentioned here that, that there is a way. And here's the faith that we have, the faith of, as we move into this, the disciples certainly as they have demonstrated their faith and Peter particularly who says you are the Christ the son of the living God for for them to know and that he's going to die and they're going to follow him and they all say we're going to stick with you and even if it means our own death Christ in that journey to Jerusalem gets this encouragement verse 28 Now about eight days after these sayings, he took with him Peter and John and James and went up on the mountain to pray. And as he was praying, the appearance of his face was altered and his clothing became dazzling white. And behold, two men were talking with him, Moses and Elijah, who appeared in glory and spoke of his departure, which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. What a conversation. And with Moses and Elijah, two of my heroes of the faith, to be able to have this conversation that not only it changes his appearance and they have come from heaven and they're there to talk with him about his departure, there must have been some sort of sweet fellowship Christ knew them in heaven. Christ has been walking around on earth and he knows Moses and all that he represents in the law and the old covenant and that Christ is going to represent the new covenant and the the doing away, not not getting rid of the law, but the change of the law, the, the application finally to people's hearts. And Elijah, this great prophet and all of the law that points to this one, Jesus Christ. And so God responds. Jump down to verse 35. A voice came out of the cloud saying, This is my son, my chosen one. Listen to him. And when the voice had spoken, Jesus was found alone, and they kept silent and told no one in those days anything of what they had seen. That God would... (laughs) I I, I think I've hopefully at least made the point Abraham was chosen out of all of the world. Noah, though he was righteous, and there had to be others that were righteous at the time, but but he looks at Noah. I mean, Noah's grandpa is still alive. He lived to be 969 years old. And is faithful to God, but he doesn't choose Methuselah, he chooses Noah. And he says, I want you to do this. For Moses... Of all the Jewish children that were spared when the edict had come out to kill all of the boys, Moses is given a name that he will deliver. This voice of God that says, My son, my chosen one, listen to him. So the disciples go on in this journey and they do end up in Jerusalem and, and Christ desires to have with them this final meal. I, I know, so you may have noticed this morning that the words were changed on one of our songs. <laughs> Did you say the wrong words? Should have heard us in practice. It was horrible. Last week, Jimmy, as he led music, started that Christmas music stuff. Christian radio station. That's all they play is Christmas music now. So we get it for a whole month. That's December. That's the day after Thanksgiving. That's, the, that's where we are. And it's what we do as a society. I, I want our hearts to be focused a little bit differently and more so than just society as we 
we move into this Christmas time, as we move into this season of thankfulness, this season of giving, this season of... I, there's, there's giving opportunities everywhere. We did Operation Christmas Child. We've done different things. There's toy drives going on. There's food drives going on. There's, there's all these things that we can do to give and give them Christ. Christ, and the words that Christ spoke at the Last Supper, and I, I, I really debated, do we have communion today or do we push it off or how do you tie communion into Elijah? And do we have to tie it into Elijah? As I got praying about it and thinking about it, it makes perfect sense for us. At this time, for us, because Christ in his own words, as he's giving the, the communion, as he's giving the, it, there it was serving the last supper, serving the, the Passover meal, he says, do this in remembrance. Well, I can't think of a better time to challenge you that as we move through this month, that we have this Christmas communion mentality, that we have this Christmas community communion, togetherness, thoughtfulness that our minds are pointed toward Christ. As we do this in remembrance, remembrance of what? Remembrance of Christ, of Christmas. That in the process that we don't forget the cross of Christmas. We sing all the songs of, ooh, a baby. And yet it was a baby who would die on the cross for us, that we would be mindful of that as we go through this. Peter, after making his profession of faith and declaring who he was, immediately is met with Christ saying, I'm going to the cross. The transfiguration, the focus there with Moses and Elijah, what are they talking about? The cross. Christ, the chosen one, chosen for what? To be the perfect sacrifice on the cross. I'm going to ask the servers for communion if you guys can come up to the front. And I'm going to stay in the book of Luke just as we take a look at this. Steve, I'll need you. Alex, if you can help out. Ralph's got a bum knee, so be praying for him, but we won't make him do the back and forth. Let me invite you to share in our communion. Um, the invitation is to believers. Anybody who is a follower of Christ, anyone who has accepted that incredible gift, not just the baby in the manger, but all the way to the cross. Somebody who has said that is a sacrifice that, that God was willing to do, but in doing so, Christ on the cross is what buys our salvation. It's what purchases us. It's, it's heaven's joy taking that bitter cup for us. So if you are a follower of Christ, if you've accepted Christ as your Savior, I invite you to take communion with us. If you haven't, it's okay. Just, you know, the, the tray can go by. And um, I, I want you to become a follower of Christ, though, and to look at communion that way, that it is something that we can look forward to. So as believers, we'll take this together. And I really, really want our focus this morning in remembering, not just to remember this Christmas season, not just to remember the Beatitudes or the Sermon on the Mount that teaches us to, to love one another and to do all of those things, but to also focus on the cross as Christ shared this meal with them just before he hung on the cross. I'm going to ask Steve if he would stand and pray for the passing. Just the, actually, I'm not going to have you do that just yet. I'll do that in a minute. As the tray goes around, here's what we've done. Um, there are two cups, one on top of the other. Make sure you grab both of them. The cup on the bottom has the bread. The cup on the top has the juice. It's a really smart way to do that. The other way wouldn't work. 
go ahead and take that and just hold on to that and we'll take communion together. So, gentlemen, if you would pass those. We will before we take it. ran out of communion cups, <laughs> but that's okay. I'm going to ask Steve to stand up and ask the blessing on the bread. Father, thank you for what this represents that we can remember because you know our frame. You know we are so forgetful, and especially in this time of the year that we think about all the the stuff that um, Christmas is about yet it should be about what we celebrate here this morning the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, the suffering of the Son of God on the cross and how he shed his blood for us for the remission of our sins. Father, if there's someone here today that does not know of the message of the cross that is found in the cradle. I pray, Father, that that would be evident to them today and that they would trust Christ. Now bless us as we participate in remembering what you've accomplished for us on the cross. We ask these things in your name. Amen. So you're just going to take the bottom cup that has the bread. Christ, after talking to his disciples and sharing with them, and for the very first time, I think, in their minds and in their lives as they, they get this full picture of the Passover meal and what it means. He says this, He took the bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. So go ahead and take the bread.
And then, Jimmy, would you ask the blessing on the cup? Father, we just thank you for the blood that you have, um, that your son has shed on the cross, and that it is the, it is um, the blood that gives us the, the, uh, the forgiveness of sins, because your son was the final sacrifice for them. And we just trust in that, God, by um, relenting, repenting of our sins, God. We, we turn 180 degrees away from them and turn to you. Um, and we just think of this cup, God, as that representation. And we thank you for that as we partake this morning. In Christ's name, amen. And so also this meal that they're having together as he had taken the cup and he'd already passed it around and told them to divide it up among themselves. And after he had asked the blessing on that, then he also told them to take this, to drink it, knowing that Christ will not drink this, that he will not drink of this cup again until he comes again. But he says, do this also in remembrance of me. So take the cup. I'm going to invite you now to stand as I invite the team back up. We'll sing a few more songs. This next song might be easy for some of you, but if you know it, sing along with us.
sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go, and search diligently for the child. And when you have found him, bring me word that I, too, may come and worship him. After, after listening to the king, they went on their way. And behold, the star that they had seen when it rose went, over, went before them until it came to rest over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly great joy. And going into the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they fell down and worshipped him. Then opening their treasures, they offered him gifts, gold and frankincense and myrrh. <laughs> stars to a place unexpected would you believe after all we projected a child in a manger lowly and small the weakest of all unlikeliest hero wrapped in his mother's shawl just a child is this who we wait Many gods have poured up 
Thank you. You may be seated. We can learn a lot in songs, can't we? Interesting things that are brought out through the words, and so very good. We're going to let the kids stay up here since we just have just a short amount of time, and you guys get to learn about Elijah with us. John Walverd was a theologian, a pastor. He was the president of Dallas Theological Seminary for 34 years. Uh, He started back in 1952 and was the president until 1986. Um, He has since passed, I believe it was in 2002, uh, when he passed away. In that time, he wrote some 30 books. Uh, He also edited one of the books that I have referenced often, and that's a, a commentary put together by Dallas Theological Seminary. Uh, he did that with Roy Zuck. So the Walverd and Zuck commentary is one that many people will know of. One of the books that he has written that I was reading in this last week is his Prophecy Knowledge book. Um, in this book, as we mentioned last week, that not all prophecy is foretelling. A lot of prophecy is telling, preaching the truth. Um, I believe, and I don't know that I have any real examples of any of the prophets as we look through them, I think every single one of them have at least some foretelling that happens. Now, primarily with Elijah, it is just a preaching ministry. But even in his own ministry, there is a foretelling of something that was going to happen. And we'll take a look at that this morning. Walverd estimates that of all of the prophecies, about 25% of it was telling something that was yet to happen. Out of all of that, 50% of it has already happened. And it is in that that you can go back and look and go, oh, that makes sense. I can see that that happened. I can see that this truly was a word from the Lord. Boy, I wrestled with that one this last week. How did Elijah hear from God? What did that look like? What did it sound like when when he went and he prayed and it didn't rain? Did, did Did he hear God's voice? Was it a feeling that he got? Was it written on a wall somewhere? Was it a a note on a memo pad that God was really the first one to do sticky notes? I I don't know. I don't know what that looks like. I don't know in in those times. I mean, with Moses, I think that there, it's pretty obvious, a burning bush that's talking. There's something about that. He's hearing God's voice. As we move into the prophets, I, I don't know. I don't know. I'm I'm okay with that. Um, I think that whatever it was, and I would say even with Noah, can you imagine somebody today, if it hadn't already happened like 6,000 years ago, somebody today saying, God's going to destroy the world with a flood, but he's spoken to me and I'm going to build a big boat and that's how the world's going to be rescued. We'd think they're crazy. It's no wonder people didn't listen to Noah. And people didn't listen to Elijah and people didn't listen to so many of the other prophets and they were tortured and they were all these things that happened to them. And so it was a hard life. Take your Bible and turn to 2 Kings chapter 2. There is something about this passage in chapter 2, this taking of Elijah that... Something was going on and God was doing an awful lot of revealing to an awful lot of people. And in this revealing, in all of this that happens, in the midst of it, Elijah is captured up to heaven in a whirlwind. I envy Elisha. I mean, it was a cool ride. Elijah got to do it, but Elisha got to watch it. How cool and how important for his own ministry. Second Kings chapter 2, I'm going to start in verse 1. We'll read just the first 14 verses here. Now when the Lord was about to take Elijah up to heaven by a whirlwind, Elijah and Elisha were on their way from Gilgal. And Elijah said to Elisha, Please stay here, for the Lord has sent me as far as Bethel. 
But Elisha said, As the Lord lives and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So they went down to Bethel. The sons of the prophets who were in Bethel came out to Elisha and said to him, Do you know that today the Lord will take away your master from over you? And he said, Yes, I know it. Now, the nice King James, or nice Bible version says, Keep quiet. He told him to shut up. Elijah said to him, Elisha, please stay here, for the Lord has sent me to Jericho. But he said, as the Lord lives and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So they came to Jericho. The sons of the prophets who were at Jericho drew near to Elisha and said to him, do you know that today the Lord will take away your master from over you? And he answered, yes, I know it. Quit talking. Elijah said to him, please stay here, for the Lord has sent me to the Jordan. But he said, as the Lord lives and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So the two of them went on. Fifty men of the sons of the prophets also went and stood at some distance from them as they both were standing by the Jordan. Then Elijah took his cloak and rolled it up and struck the water and the water was parted to the one side and to the other till the two of them could go over on dry ground. When they had crossed, Elijah said to Elisha, Ask what I shall do for you before I am taken from you. And Elisha said, Please let there be a double portion of your spirit on me. And he said, You have asked a hard thing. Yet, if you see me as I am being taken from you, it shall be so for you. But if you do not see me, it shall not be so. And as they still went on and talked, behold, chariots of fire and horses of fire separated the two of them. And Elijah went up by a whirlwind into heaven. And Elisha saw it, and he cried, My father, my father, the chariots of Israel and its horsemen. And he saw them no more. Then he took hold of his own clothes and tore them in two pieces. And he took up the cloak of Elijah that had fallen from him and went back and stood on the bank of the Jordan. Then he took the cloak of Elijah that had fallen from him and struck the water, saying, Where is the Lord, the God of Elijah? And when he had struck the water, the water was parted to the one side and to the other, and Elisha went over. What a way to go. What a way to go to, to have this young student with you and they're conversing and all of these sons of the prophets, these boys in prophet school, these men that are together that have all seen that Elijah, this is his last day. Elisha, did you know that? Like they would need to tell him. And it had been revealed to him and it had been revealed to Elijah and it was all that something that was yet to happen and Elisha needed only to be there. He, of course, wanted them to quit talking about it. I know, I know, I know. Quit talking about it. I'm sticking with him. And he does. And these horses of fire and a chariot of fire that come and separate them from the rest and this whirlwind comes by and picks up Elijah and takes him to heaven. I think that there's, there's something... There's, there's little pictures that we get in these lives of these heroes as they point forward to Christ and what is going to happen and, and who is Christ and, and what do we see. And we start to see in their own lives these fulfillments of Scripture in Christ himself. For Abraham as the father who his, from him comes the blessing to all nations for Noah who would take them and rescue them and save them and that they would be set apart and that there would be deliverance. For Moses who delivers them out and creates the, the old covenant, the covenant between he and God and the people of Israel and all that the law represents and all that it shows of God's love for those people and how much bigger Christ is in the new covenant. And here is Elijah, and Elisha is standing there looking up to heaven like the disciples are going to be found in the book of Acts as he's taken away. That is not the only prophecy that happens telling what the people would begin to look for. We covered this when we went through the book of Malachi. Turn there if you would. The last book of the Old Testament, Malachi chapter 4.
as Malachi is talking to the nation and telling them that they need to turn away from their wicked ways, that they need to follow the laws, that they need to love God with all of their heart, that that there needs to be a turning for them, and that there is a day of reckoning coming. The fearful day of the Lord is is going to happen. And this is truly the last message from God that they're going to hear from a prophet before Christ comes. And there's a span of 400 years. And so these are his last words in Malachi chapter 4, verse 5. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. He will turn the hearts of fathers to their children and the hearts of children to their fathers, lest I come and strike the land with a decree of utter destruction. Now, there's a lot of ambiguity here on who that Elijah is. Who do we look for? Who, who are we going to say is that Elijah? Who is it, like, literally, is Elijah going to come back? I mean, he didn't die. So is he going to come back in person, or, or will it be somebody who represents Elijah, or, or will he? There's a lot of questions. And so I think people start to think, okay, this could be Elijah or this could be Elijah. Christ answers part of this question in Matthew chapter 11. In Matthew 11, as he's, he's heard from John the Baptist, there are some of his students, some of his followers that have come to Christ and these messengers, and Christ answers this about John the Baptist. Matthew 11, starting in verse 11. Truly I say to you, among those born of women, there has risen no one greater than John the Baptist. Yet the one who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. From the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven has suffered violence, and the violent take it by force. For all the prophets and the law prophesied until John. And if you are willing to accept it, he is Elijah who is to come. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. I think I would have been standing there going, I must not have ears because I don't get it. For Christ to say that John the Baptist is a prophet and as a prophet, as a teacher, he comes and he's, he is Elijah, if you're willing to accept it, that he is this Elijah that was promised. He is the Elijah that was, was told of in Malachi and yet he's not the Elijah because the great and terrible day of the Lord hasn't come. Look also at, at how he phrases this. Verse 14, if you are willing to accept it, he is Elijah who is to come. That there's still something more there. And it's not the complete fulfillment of the prophecy. I think there's also very good reason to take a look at that prophecy in Malachi. And the second part of that, verse 6, really points to not John the Baptist, but Christ himself in his ministry. And so as he stands there, and there are people who are asking questions. So when he goes to his disciples and he says, who do the people say that I am? Some say you're John the Baptist, risen from the dead. Some say you're Elijah. It's because they were expecting Elijah. And this might be it because John the Baptist has now been beheaded and he can't possibly have been the Elijah because we're still going on. We've been looking at Luke chapter 9. Go back there for a second. It wasn't just the Jews who were faithful who were fearing this or looking for this. In Luke chapter 9, look at verse 7. Now Herod the Tetrarch heard about all that was happening, all that's going on with Christ and the healing ministry that he has and his sending out of his 12 apostles. Herod hears about this. He's perplexed because it was said by some that John had been raised from the dead, by some that Elijah had appeared, and by others that one of the prophets of old had risen. Herod said, John, I beheaded. But who is this about whom I hear such things? And he sought to see him. And so this this promise of Elijah, there is 
no small speculation that the two prophets that are mentioned in the book of Revelation, Revelation chapter 11, we're not going to turn there right now and read that, but if you read through there, there are two witnesses that come. Elijah is thought to be one of those. Not a hill I'm willing to die on. He might be, he might not be. There's thought that it could be Elijah and Moses. There's thought that it could be Elijah and Enoch, since those two were taken up and didn't die. There's thought that it could be two entirely unrelated witnesses to what we know of Scripture. Still looking for Elijah. In Hebrews 11, we've run back there several times just as we look through this this book of faith and the faithful men and women and as we take a look at the different ones through the Old Testament and referring back to them and how incredible their faith was, Elijah's not even mentioned by name in that list. I think he might be mentioned for some of the stuff that happened. But we do find him mentioned in the book of James and we'll turn there and close with this passage. In James chapter 5, I mentioned earlier that one of the remarkable things, one of the special things, the incredible heroic things of these men of faith is not only their faith, but here with Elijah, his, his ability, his, the way that he prays, the way that he spends time in conversation with God. In, in all of them, I think it's incredible that God would, for some, come down and have a conversation with them and would say, I want to fill them in on what's going on. Or for Moses, as he's there and God's ready to destroy all of Israel and start over, and Moses like, whoa, no, 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 wait a minute, wait a minute. For, for Noah, that I, I do believe Noah probably heard... God's audible voice. I, I don't know that for sure. I don't know how else you get the dimensions of an ark. But one of the most incredible things with that is go ahead and get in the ark and I'll shut the door. And Elijah to boldly go before God and say, this is what my prayer is. When he, when he finds the widow as God has directed him, he finds the widow and he tells her to go get bread and don't worry about it. Your jar of oil will never run out and your jar of flour will never run out as long as I'm here. As long as there's this drought in the land. That boldness. And so here we're encouraged to pray in James chapter 5. I'm going to start in verse 7. Be patient, therefore, brothers, until the coming of the Lord. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, being patient about it until it receives the early and the late rains. You also be patient. Establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is at hand. Do not grumble against one another, brothers, so that you may not be judged. Behold, the judge is standing at the door. As an example of suffering... And patience, brothers, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. Behold, we consider those blessed who remained steadfast. You have heard of the steadfastness of Job. And you have seen the purpose of the Lord, how the Lord is compassionate and merciful. But above all, my brothers, do not swear either by heaven or by earth or by any other oath, but let your yes be yes and your no be no, so that you may not fall under condemnation. Is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing praise. Is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the one who is sick and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours, and he prayed fervently that it might not rain, and for three years and six months it did not rain on the earth. Then he prayed again, and heaven gave rain, and the earth bore its fruit. 
And so we have a lesson on prayer. We have this lesson on what faith looks like. We have this lesson on what God would have us to do as believers, as not, not being anxious about what is to come, but to be patient and endure suffering. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. There is great righteousness and the righteous ones are found are those that are seeking to be pleasing to God. That we are to be patient, that we are to endure that suffering, that we are to encourage one another and not judge one another. That's a received a bad phrase, don't judge me, or but just in a sense to in in our encouragement to one another, yeah, we make mistakes, but we can encourage. And that is why we're called to repent and to to confess our sins to one another because we're all bad at this. To remain steadfast like the prophets, knowing that there is a reward for enduring. To be honest to let our yes be yes and our no be no. And most certainly to call on the faithfulness of others. That as we would take a look at this man, Elijah, who does not some superhuman, he has a nature just like you and I do. He struggled just like you and I do. But he figured out faith. He figured out how to live a life that calls on God in an incredible way and a man of incredible prayer strength. So strengthen your faith, pray out to God, and be encouraged by one another. Let's pray together as, I, as the team comes up. Father, it is so hard to <laughs> know how much do we look like or hope that we are like some of these heroes of faith and and yet know that there are some things that we are so far away from all that they did and all that they accomplished and is it really possible in our lives father i'm thankful that you don't call me to be an elijah and you don't call me to be a moses but you do call me to be faithful you do call me to spend time in prayer and to know that you are the God who rewards all those who seek you out. So Father, if I never part the Red Sea, if I never raise a widow's son from the dead, let me be found faithful. Father, we pray this for everyone in this room that, that we would discover in, in this season of Christmas, in this season of, of thankfulness, in this season of where giving seems natural, help us discover that you gave the ultimate gift, that you gave the only gift that, that could matter in our lives for eternity. And Father, in finding that gift, Help us to live a life that demonstrates faith in you, trusting in you. We pray it in Christ's name. Amen. I'm going to have you stand. I feel like we had so much fun last week, and as long as we're talking about Elijah, (laughs) we might as well just do it again. And so sing it out. We're going to do Days of Elijah, and then we'll be dismissed.
Jessica tried to get the guitar players to do a jump at the end, but they weren't. <laughs> yeah. Uh, this morning, we had a time of fellowship, as we have spoken many times. Uh, Linda's retiring, and so, yay! <laughs> She's like, oh, I don't have to put up with him anymore. So all the forgotten times of not getting the message title to her or... <laughs> Whatever. Uh, Linda, I don't, how many years have you done it? Ten? I only saw five, and I'm like, it's way more than that. <laughs> it doesn't seem like anything more than 50, so... <laughs> um, just so thankful for her, and so just make sure uh, there's a point set on the back for you. That's yours, and your bonus will be in your next check. And... <laughs> Um, just really, really thankful for uh, the work that she has done. Uh, we did hire a new secretary. Merv's going to take over those, that job, and so he started learning that. He, he needed something else to do. He was bored. <laughs> um, and so Merv will be taking over those duties. And so just, uh, Linda, thank you, thank you, thank you for all that you've done. And I think you're still on until the end of December. Yeah. So uh, thank you, Linda. God is faithful. God is good. Uh, let's shout together. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God.